Uh, she's a family, uh, she, she's an entrepreneur with interest in media and agriculture. So welcome very much. Welcome very much our, our panelists and also our, our participants. I've seen um, some very key people that I know. I'm seeing Wanja, Wanja Naiton, Nana Wanjao of the Commonwealth Business Association. I see Njokiwa Mai, who was our previous panelist, Nerea Oketch. Um, I see also the gentleman, Makolon de Charles, um, and among many others. So I will just, and uh, Warponge as well as many others. So we really just jump into this question of what is it that women want? And as when we posted this to the social media, we had a lot of feedback, especially on the question of, and it was something that we had actually been expecting, uh, the question of, but why are these the women representing what women want? And, and I think that's a question that's always been coming up, um, especially in the political circles. And Karibu Sana Mwashimwa Wamuchomba, she joined us, that when women, when we have the highest caliber of women representing women's wants, they're always told that, who are you to talk about women's interests? Um, you are, where you're not representing the grassroots interests, you have degrees and everything. But then we never ask ourselves, the men in parliament, the men talking about representation, why is it that, why is it that they don't then turn on that on themselves and talk about, about the, the, shop, the, the shoe shiners and the border border riders and the and and, and the, the um, really just men at the grassroots. There's no term like men, grassroots men, but there's a term like grassroots women. So I'll just so just putting that out there at the beginning because women, there's a way in which there's an attempt to penalize women for achievement. It's like you can't whether you if you achieve, it's wrong. If you don't achieve, it's wrong. Yeah. So I wanted to foreground that and say that this panel is a panel that truly represents women. Um, of course, there's so many voices out there, but there has to be organization and there has to be a system and a structure for things to get done. And so this is a panel that is with us today. So we're asking about a political wish list, which means from the political field, from the political system, what is it that women want? What are the wants of women from different sectors? Um, that they want to see in policy, that they want to see the politicians uh, really actually paying attention to. And I'm going to ask, we're going to do a quick round of all of you just talking about what is it that in the next election that you want, if political parties to speak to your constituents, now the women constituents in your networks, for them to be taken seriously, what is it that you believe is important um, that should be on, on those manifestos whenever, when they're talking to women? So maybe we could begin with um, we could begin with Nyakan Karibu Sana. Um, thank you so much, um, Kingwa. It's an honor to be online and discussing an issue that is very very imperative to to growth of any nation. You know, uh, when we're looking at national, regional, and global growth, and you're looking at economic and uh, social development. We cannot ignore and be silent about um, matters that touch on women, okay? And uh, when I look at women, I'm looking at it from a strategic and a sustainable angle, okay? And thank you so much for uh, not being an ostrich and bringing to fore some of the conversations that happen, you know, on the streets and out there that who are the women who represent, you know, what we call the grassroots. I personally don't necessarily like the word grassroots because grass is so on the ground and grass is, is for herding, you know, what people eat, what the, the, the cows graze on. And I think that we have, we just have women representation at different levels, at community level, in private sector, in development, in the public sector and government, and at different tiers for a very good reason, okay? So, you know, when we're looking at wish lists, and I know we have almost two hours on this call to sort of, you know, discuss and talk about a lot of things. Some of the wish lists include, you know, policies, inclusion, enablers, investment. And when I speak about investment, I'm looking at resource mobilization and resource allocation towards matters that are important, you know, for women to be included in development. But I'd just like to uh, move away from that because I know we'll have time to go deeper into those areas. I'd love to speak about um, some of the things that I feel, you know, from a political space, what are some of the things that if we put in place, you know, as a nation, as a continent, as, as a global you know, conversation, I think there will be a, an opportunity and a chance 
for women and men to work together to win and to win as far as development and sustainable development is, is concerned. You know, uh, you know, there's lots of words that are, seems to be acronyms and clich cliches like mm -hmm. sustainable development. But when you look at it, we want to develop in a way that is generational, you know, in a way that what we do today affects the future of tomorrow. People who will be born when we're not here will find what we as the leaders of today have put in place and have, and have done during our lifetime. Okay, and that's the word sustainable, all right, to give meaning to that. And when I look at um, some of the key triggers for that success in our generation and the generations to come, and when we are political, you know, all countries are gearing for political election, you know, Kenya's just around the corner on its political cycle, 2022, uh, being an election year, and now parties are fronting, they're regrouping, they're developing manifestos. Some of the things that I feel we need to see very, very visibly you know, are, are things that are, I'm calling enablers, okay? You're looking at political goodwill from the top. That has so much muscle, you know? I had the privilege of hosting the Timeless Women Conference in February in Kigali, Rwanda. And when a lot of women came over and lots of men and global players from all over to Kigali, 80% of the countries that were represented there were keen to learn and see how it is that Rwanda has 64% of women representation in parliament. And not just in parliament, it's stretching across even the other sectors, private sector and development. How are they doing it, do, doing this? And I had the privilege to have, you know, very close um, conversations with the minister then, you know, High Excellency Ambassador Solin, who was then the minister of gender, but now the minister of justice. And I asked her, how is it that you have managed as an African country to have that high percentage of women in representation, you know, 64%. And these were the things which I believe, you know, really, really make the difference. Political goodwill at the top. She said, our president is a feminist. He is completely sold out to ensuring that women are included, not just because it's good to have, not because you're, you're having, you're, you, you know, you're, 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 you're having mercy on women, but because it is strategic and it makes sense for development. When you have women at the center, at the forefront of development, your whole community is developed, okay? So I think political goodwill at the highest level and that commitment to have inclusion is very, very important. So as we're starting to, to put together our political parties, you know, the leaders of these political parties and the key task forces, you know, must be thinking about being strategically uh, organized to be able to bring inclusion that, that guarantees development, okay? The second thing that I feel is so important is to have a legal framework. I know in Kenya, we do have a legal framework. I know a lot of countries in Africa have a, a legal framework but a legal framework that's backed up with a, a, a gender budgeting, you know, gender-based budgeting, so that money resource is allocated, you know, according to those, you know, budget, budget lines, okay? That guarantees that indeed there will be inclusion on the ground and a compliance mechanism. So it's not just enough to have, you know, a policy, but a budgeting mechanism that's mainstreamed, factoring in, you know, um, gender components within all budget allocations, but, you know, resource mobilization, and utilization, all right? And a compliance framework that is actually respected. That is key to mention, that is respected and that people follow, okay? So I think that is, that is second. And then the third thing I think is just for us to adopt an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. Because when you look at the data, you know, Kenya is 50.8% female, okay? And when you're looking at numbers in terms of election and, and the outcomes of elections, it should be a no brainer that, you know, mm -hmm. if we just united, we would, we would be able to, to push an agenda that we believe in, but we're so fragmented, we're so disjointed, and there's a lot of co unhealthy competition and a scarcity mindset that has, you know, an ideology of if I support this or I support that, I will not be able to go forward. And I think that it's time that, that not just women, but also political parties sat down and looked at the agenda and the issues at hand. Because I think that where development is concerned, it's not just a matter of gender and not just a matter of women. It's a matter of development, inclusion, and issues. What are the issues that we need to front, okay? How are we pushing them forward? And how can we support the right people to push them forward? And then lastly, I, I hear the arguments of quality versus quantity, okay? And, you know, do we have just as many women or do we have just enough, you know, let's just have women first and then we, we care about quality later. 
I think that it's a mix of both, okay? Because I think in the narrative where most men are playing, you know, in, the, in, in, in most leadership positions, where, whether you look at it as political, as cultural, as religious, as, as corporate, you know, in terms of the business world, you will see that almost 80 to 90% of the strong positions are held by men, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you're looking at quality and quantity conversations, I think let's look at who's on the table. And if women need to come on the table, we need to be competing equally in terms of like not expecting just handouts, okay? Even though we need affirmative action to bring numbers in. And I'm sure this conversation today, you know, the array of panelists that we have will bring a huge and good debate around that area, okay? But I believe that we need to bring value to the table and be able to articulate that value. Because those who are on the table, mostly men, you know, are, are wondering why do we need women? What are they bringing on the table? Their minds are geared to look at value, okay? They're not the geared to be what, what we call in Kenya, boye, have mercy on, you understand? So yes. if we're able to articulate value, then I think that it's going to be imperative. When people see why it makes sense for yes. me to have a female, not necessarily because she's female, but because she brings value to the table. When you come to the table talking about consumer decisions, 94% of consumer decisions are driven by women. That means women decide where the money that's in the pockets of men is going to be used. You understand? It then makes a lot of sense that you must have a number of women on the, in the boardroom table and in strategy and in the decision table, okay? Determining where money and strategy and marketing and, and you know, is going to go to. What is the consumer going to do? When a man hears that, he makes room for a woman because she's representing his largest demographic of consumer, of consumer purchases. You understand? Okay, Thank when you, you look at the table and you tell men that, you know, um, the largest consumer of health services are women and children, they need to be on the table to determine how we are resourcing, allocating, and building the health, the health system, including the policies. You know, people will listen to that because that's where you win. Yes. When 80% of small scale farmers in Africa are women. You know, I could okay. listen to you for three hours and I have had the opportunity to exactly. hear you, but exactly. I'm going to just very quickly um, ask, because we want to also hear from Esther or Chien, but just as, as we have her speak, you've yes. brought out some very powerful things. And I love, because for me, getting into the entrepreneurship space is a recent thing, but it's yeah. so interesting that you're actually articulating some of what I've been hearing from the spaces that I've been, which is mostly the sort of like, human rights and, uh, and, 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 and political space. And there's four key things that come out. So you talked about enablers. Um, you talked about the necessity of political goodwill and Daisy Amdani, who we've previously had as a guest, um, talks about that quite a bit. I think you guys should meet because she's like, there is no political goodwill in this country for women's issues and for women themselves. Yes. Use the term feminist. And I, I noticed, and I liked that because I noticed that there's a way in which in this day and age, the, the term feminism is like, it's like, it's like, it's like the devil, you know, there's a way in which the society, especially men, there's a, there's a, there's a very visceral reaction to it when they hear the word feminist. So, so that's a very interesting thing. Um, the question of where, well, let, let's, let's bookmark that. Let's bookmark that as, as an interesting question of the, 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 the term feminism and how it's become, it's been so demonized that it, that one would, so many people are even afraid to call themselves feminists today. And then the last thing that you said that I just was so powerful was the concept of value, uh, because it also ties into what we are trying to do here, which is um, re in, in the context of recognizing that there is no women as a constituency in the political market have no value. So the question is, then how do we make sure that women become not just a valuable constituency, but the most valuable constituency. So that's a very interesting thing. Uh, so very interesting points you brought up. Um, Easter Karibusana, uh, very interested to hear your thoughts. If you were asked about what the top five wants of the women that you represent um, in, in Kisumu and in your different endeavors, what, what, what is, it, is it that you say that they would be? I need money. <laughs> women need money, women need the resources, because one of the things is that all these things that we want, even to get into leadership, needs resources. And the financial resources, for example, for many women in the political sphere, campaign financing has been a challenge. So if you're looking at engaging women and they do not have the campaign, sustained campaign financing, which goes back to our patriarchal issues. When we look at our socialization and the patriarchy, which then ensures that women 
and girls do not have access to resources, then it becomes a challenge. Because when we look at that, when women must have not just access, but control over resources. If you look at where we come from, um, land, who controls land? Land is what we usually use. You can sell it, you can plant on it, and then get access to different resources, even financial resources. But when many women have just access, but not have control over those resources. So in terms of the different resources that we require, whether it is the human resource that you require to be able to do stuff, those things then we need to start engaging on. Whether it is the financial resource which you need to do, to utilize, to get into the political space, those are the things that we require. But one of the things is that what women want, we need to unyoke patriarchy and the socialization, which then ensures that even when you're in the economic space, then you're not able to engage holistically. One of the things which we, in the area where I work, we work with women in the aquaculture sector. So when we're looking at women in terms of control, you have the resources, but you still have this person who controls your access to the water, who are usually male. So even when you're looking at some of these things is that how do we then shift that conversation so that we look at positive cultural values then which then ensure that one, the resources which are controlled by women can't be controlled by women and they can acquire more resources. One of the things which we are looking at when you're saying that um, the value of women, women are very valuable as voters. That's what I have realized. They are the ones who vote mostly. But then when it comes to electing them as political leaders, that is when we have a challenge. So how do we shift that conversation? In terms of the issue of, for us, when we look at our organizing, we must get into an intersectional organizing and be consistent with the organizing. How do we ensure movements are thriving? We've lost grip on our movement. So we have tended to work along in silos. We need women from political movements to work with women from social movements, to work with women from uh, labor movements because those women okay. can resource, mm -hmm. yeah? So one of the things which you're looking at is that as we are looking at this one, how do we do intersectional organizing? And how do we do intergenerational organizing? One of the challenges that we have faced that whenever you ask who are the, the political leaders, you can write a history book, but you don't have younger women joining the movement. Apart from Madam President, who you are here, in the terms of the, at your age when you join the issues of politics, how many younger women are actually joining politics? How many young girls can actually speak that I want to join politics without having people shoving it down their throat that you're not capable of doing politics, politics is bad. One of the things which we look at is that in terms of some of the challenges that we are facing is that we have to remove the, the, the levels of violence which women face when they want to participate in the different spaces. So you look at the political field, there's a lot of verbal violence and even physical violence within the political space. In the economic space, in the areas where we come from, we have the issue of sex for fish when you want to do, and you have the money. So there's the issue of sexual violence even when you have the product. So in the, the, the spaces where we are, the issue of sexual harassment, which even though there's harassment for both, there's more harassment towards the, the female in terms of the data that we see. So even in the, the spaces where we are looking at, in the boardrooms when we are talking about how many women have been sexually harassed, so too many people don't want to get into those particular, uh, those particular spaces. So in our different spaces when we are engaging, that is what we are looking at, is that when you look at the barriers, which other people faced. Sometimes the barriers, if you're not having, if you're not coming from strong stock and you have spaces where people can actually give you support, then you always have a, a challenge. But whenever we look at the, even the membership, the resources for you to even be in a member of a political party and be able to participate in those particular spaces consistently, sometimes is a challenge for many people who have to ask for permission to attend because we have been socialized to ask for permission to go to certain spaces. So one of the things we are asking, what is our socialization like? Do we look at our social structures, which then ensure that you cannot participate unless your partner then gives you permission to participate in those particular levels. And then when all decisions are made, particularly in certain spaces, they're not made in our conventional boardrooms. So how many of us are able to then get into those unconventional spaces one of the things we tell people, bring your own table, create a side table or bring your own chair. Because when the chair is not put there, 
create that space for yourself. It is not easy, but it is something which then if you come as a collective, we can do. So part of it is that if you're looking at the decision-making tables, when you're talking about women in the boardrooms, how many of them are actually then engaging in the process of mentorship? We need to look at how to then organize ourselves and mentor people so that we are consistently having foot soldiers to jump into the, into the race. And I so one of the challenges that, that we're having is that- to, I love that you've started going towards what we need to do. Um, and I also like just really to capture what some of the key things that you talked about. Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the aspect of that, we need to unyoke patriarchy. So you gave us that very, that big overview because and I like that because it does cut across. It's, it's something that's seen in the socioeconomic center. It's something that's uh, a challenge mm -hmm. in the political sector. It's something that's a challenge. Yes, like we said, the social and economic. In the sector. social so, spaces. Yes, and also yeah. about violence um, because there's the relationship between violence and patriarchy. And especially mm -hmm. we as a Kenya, as a nation that has never, we have two, our, our relationship with violence is too intimate. It's too, we have a very unhealthy strain of, of uh, I don't know if you call it max, masculinity or patriarchy, but, but, but there That's is it, that relationship. Yes, um, yeah. which, are, which are phrases that have, that are, that are like live wires today. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that. Um, and then also just what you said about intersectionality. And I think this part of these conversations are the beginning of that because as we were thinking about like even this session and, and previous sessions, something that was always on my mind was why do we never have my Wanawake in these discussions? Why have I never met with them? Like, why is it that there's the activists on this side, there's the entrepreneurs on this side? Like, and so, um, so for me today, this is a historic occasion where the, where the history book writers, <laughs> they should write this today. So yeah, so I, I'll very, just very quickly now move to uh, Madame Rehab Muyu. Very, very happy, very honored to have you here um, and just uh, to represent my Deloya Anawaki organization, which is uh, now that we're talking about history, historically the oldest women's organization in the country. Um, and so maybe just to get from you um, that the, the question of what is it that women want? And I, I, so Easter mentioned, talked about the political side of, she mentioned a bit of the politics, but even away from the politics, because the politics is one part of it, is, is one part of the solution, but outside of the political realm in terms of running, what is it that women want on the, on, like what is it that your women want, your constituents? What are the needs? Like if you, if you are to say, these are the top three needs that keep on emerging from my constituency. What are those needs? What, what would you say those needs are? Thank you. Thank you, Kigo, and good evening to all of you. <clears throat> and I also thank my colleagues, the panelists. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes, hear me? we can. Yes, we can. Just to say that uh, I hope Moshmiwa got my congratulations as the chair of Kewapa, Moshmiwa of Kiambu. Now, let me start by saying that uh, I am representing my Ndeleo, an institution of about 4 million women and about 68 years old this year. And what do women want? Women want security. Women want to be safe. Women want to have food on the table for their children. Women want to have food on the table for their grandchildren. Women need to be able to have a shoulder when they are widowed, when they lose their husbands. And I'm going to just write where it is, I mean the grassroots. So just to correct that grassroots is what is formerly called machinane. This is where the bulk of our women are. What is probably in Nairobi is a very small percentage. Most of the women are in grassroots. And yes, that's my endeavor. It's a grassroots women organization. And it's been around. It has brought in very many women in politics. Many women, we stand for economic empowerment, political and, and social empowerment. And we, our members run from 18 years. So yes, the, the, the poverty we are seeing now, those are our girls. Those are the girls we need to consider and think about. So let me talk about starting from the representation, touch a bit on the politics. Yes, it is very well to have the two thirds, but also then we need service delivery after that. We need water, we need healthcare, 
women need infrastructure so that they can take their wares to the markets. We need to deliver our produce in the markets. But then we also come across the taxation in the counties where Mamambogas are paying money every other day. And I'm very happy that we have Moishimiwa there who will be maybe asking to send a bill for us in parliament to make sure we have a water tank of 10,000 liters in every home because women need dignity, women need integrity. We need to restore the African positive culture, the values we had when we grew some of us. The role modeling, who are the role models today? The economic empowerment, life during COVID and after COVID has really been something for the women. So we as um, Mind Leo, we are very clear that many things have been lost along the way and we need to pick our pieces and move on collectively. So when women are then in leadership, the two thirds which we support, you hear me? Yes. You hear me? The two thirds which we supported right from over 20 years ago when the journey started and even before because the first the, the first mama to go to Lejiko Geshaga was a Mandelion member and, 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 and you know, and Ruth Abwao and, and the story continued. So what we say is that uh, having watched the journey and documented, we feel that there's a time, uh, it, the women were not as many in, in, in maybe 20 years ago. We just had like six women in parliament. There's a time we had uh, Mama Ngilo, we had Mama Mugo, we had Mother Karua, we had Zibora Kiton and a few others. And we really saw a lot of work happen and I hope Moshimiwa can hear me here with a lot of humility. And then we campaigned and went ahead. I remember we were in City Hall, I remember we went to parliament, I remember we went to everybody with a member of parliament campaigning for the 47 women member uh, parliament. And it took Mother Karua and the charity Gilu in Naivasha to walk out and say we must have the 47. So therefore, before we talk about Rwanda and 64%, because life is real. We have 87 in parliament. What can we do with the numbers we have? It's not so many of the numbers sometimes. Mama Michelle told us, Gracia Michelle in two or three, she was here for a meeting in New Stanley and I attended and she said, she alone has the unique opportunity of being a first lady twice. So what she does when she sits with the president, she makes sure what the women cannot put on the table she is able to take it for us. So it is not the numbers. It is what, what can you do as self Kiwa? What can Rahab do? What can Moeshmi wa, wa Mushomba do? The numbers are good, but I can tell you sometimes the journey can be walked by very few people. So how do we work, work together? This is what my Andelio is looking for. As soon as we got in office, I remember looking out for all the women reps who work together. This constituency belongs to women of Kenya. So I think it's a campaign we need to do both women in parliament and women out of parliament. So it's not about the numbers I want to repeat, but what comes out of the numbers? What is the delivery? I want to talk about uh, UHC. It is no longer today a social issue. With COVID, it is an economic issue. What is Wamushomba and the other women going to do for us in parliament? So we are saying we, 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 are saying we know where the need is. We've just been talking about the 150 girls who have gotten pregnant. And in another Zoom I was in, like last week, Dr. Riria told us it could be 500,000. Where are we taking these children? So yes, what do we want? We want cottage industries at the grassroots. We want, you know, the water harvesting at the grassroots. We want to take a bill as Maendeleo and say, and Wamushomba, my sister, I'm committing you there. We were together in Kiambu campaigning, if you remember. We want a water tank in every home in the 47 counties across. What we want, we want to start this journey from some place. So mm -hmm. the bigger things will find us. We want to know what sales in Kiambu in the market and which women of Kiambu are going to benefit. What industry are they going to have in Kiambu? And the women in, 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 in where I am in Machago, so the women in, you know, in, 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 in Tukana and what they want to sell their goods and everybody has, has what they want to do in their own spaces. So let us start small. I want us to look at it from the grassroots because this is where the real life is. This is where you fetch water now. It is dry. I can tell you, Nukambani, you see women walking with, you know, with, 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 you know, with, with jerry cans going to fetch water. When should we get out of this? So what do women want? Women want to vote the government, but women want to get something out of the government. We want to work together with our, with our sisters in parliament. 
We want to work together with our sister in Senate and we want to send bills now. I'm very happy about FGM. It has gone down a little. We must eradicate by 2022, but we are saying working together, we are going to be able to have solutions which work for our women at the grassroots. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very grounded and very concise and very particular uh, about what women want, security, food on the table, um, I'm sure the emotional support for the for the hard times. Um, and you talked about infrastructure, the environment, really an, an environment in which they can go about their day-to-day -day activities um, with safety and um, and yeah, with safety and just really to be productive. So th those are some very strong points. And I I noticed that you talked about also the question of econo the economic aspect of things like finding out economic opportunities. And I think even after this, you and Nyakan June should uh, touch base and compare notes because Nyakan has programs across around the, in different parts of the country that are aimed at eco economic empowerment of women, seeking, helping, seek out, helping, actually identifying opportunities where a lot of women can be involved in and then bringing them on board. So I think you too, it would be very useful if you are able to, um, to then yeah, just compare notes after this. Uh, I also like that you talked about the working together and that you asked Mweshimiwa Wamushomba, what are they doing? And I wanna say something because uh, Mweshimiwa Wamushomba, you're very welcome, but I'm, I'm going to defend you in a, in, a, in a bit of a way because one of the things we've noticed in this series of discussions is that when we talk to the women politicians is that there's a way in which, first of all, the, the number of women politicians is very few, it's very small. Um, then there might be support for them be, before they go in, but when they go in, they're not given any support. No one is holding their hand. There's no, like they are left on their own. And if we know, knowing our parliament as it is, it is the most, it's like a toxic wasteland. So, so for me right now is that I, I'm, I'm looking at it from the concept of we actually need to be reaching out to our female parliamentarians and not even so much about putting them to task, which is important, but also finding out, okay, what are your challenges? How can we work together? Uh, because that is, it is when we do that, that we'll be able to see wins for all of us. But thank you very much, uh, Madam Moya for, for that. Uh, very grounded, very grounded thoughts and very useful. So uh, Karibu Sana, Honorable Gabboni. Uh, we are very happy to have you here with us. And uh, just, we had introduced you earlier, so that's, that's why I'm not going to introduce you here right now, but everyone knows you. Um, but even before I ask you to come on board, I also want to recognize and acknowledge our, our guests, uh, the guests that, uh, yeah, the participants rather, um, and some of the comments that are going. I'm seeing we have people from Malawi, um, some of the from Malawi, um, from South Africa, uh, yeah, yeah, very, um, and, and different parts. Um, and some of the comments coming up, uh, uh, Sarah Muni says, I'm Sarah Muni, President Youth in Africa. I'm interested in joining politics to serve my constituents in uh, Kirinyaga County in Parliament. How can I join my Deleo Nawake? Dr. Pacifica Okemwa says, political positions are important for women. Numbers are important as every now and again, decisions are made by the vote. Uh, Joshua Dongo says, great initiative, I share your sentiments. Nelly Rassi says, I agree with you, Easter, on the aspect of mentorship, intergenerational mentorship between feminists should also be encouraged and look, looked into. Um, uh, so yes, do please keep on giving in your, your thoughts. Uh, we, we shall keep on sharing them. So Moshimiwa, if you were to be asked, you first of all being a women rep um, and you being uh, the chairperson of Kewopa, if you were to be asked, what are the top three wants of women, and not women in, in terms of in the trying to get into political seats, but women on the actual ground, what are the, what are the top three things? And I, I, want, I want to contextualize my, my question is that we have never had an actual constituency called women in this country. There has never been a collective voice. Um, and part of the issue there is there has never been a collective issue that women have come together and said, you know what, there's so many things, but for now, this, this top three or these number, these are the number one if, if, if for us to be, um, to, 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 have, to have had our needs addressed. So, Kaibu Sana, Honorable Wamushamba. Oh, you'll need to unmute. You'll need to unmute yourself. 
Thank you very much, my sisters, and uh, my sincere apologies. I'm slightly late because I'm still on the road, as you can see. Um, I'm from Mashinani. Mashinani means I'm from the village. <laughs> I am from a certain village called Gedongori. <laughs> Mingling with the women. And I can hear my chair there saying that, I don't know whether it's my chair who said that not really Mashinani women, but those are the ones that matters in politics. And yes, that is the indeed. people, those are the people we really represent. If you really want to represent uh, people, please uh, represent the village ones because they, they have no hope other than us who are you know, elected to represent them. So I'm very honored to be in this uh, uh, discussion. I hope I'm going to put some little value to it. Um, irrespective of the fact that I'm still on the road, but it's uh, just a few minutes I'll be home. Um, for me, uh, the women of Kenya, some of, we, of whom I represent in Kiambu County, the women of Kenya requires or wishes to be properly represented. In terms of equity, they need to be served as as the, as the same way that we treat the men in terms of like when you go to Mashinani, today I was giving out umbrellas because it's very sunny and dusty. And when you give a male cast, a male businessman, you know, these uh, people who sell fruits and, uh, and wares on the roadside or by the roadside, you give a male cast, uh, um, uh, businessman an umbrella, the woman will always say, where is mine? <laughs> they want us to be to treat them equally. They want to be treated equally. They want to be represented equally. Um, women uh, basically are very simple. They just want to be given their dignity. Mm. Dignity, in fact, when you go to a forum and say, Nimemaliza uh, mkutano, but nataka tuonge na wamama. They feel mm. so honored to be mm. given that dignity that mm. can even secure. They want to be dignified because, you know, they are so much oppressed in the villages. The patriarchal, patriarchal systems have encroached into their spaces. The patriarchal order has enshrined them into cocoons of... Uh, of, of slavehood. And therefore, whenever you dignify the women in terms of making sure that they are hard, they are, they, their spaces are respected, their economic rights are fulfilled, they feel very honored. And therefore, to me, for anybody who wishes to represent women, the wish list number one for women is to be dignified is to be given the opportunity to, to occupy their space rightly and to be equated to the to the all members of, of public. They want to be treated like they belong to the world, like they were created as Sarahs of the of the world, not the Abrahams of the world. Number two, the women that we represent wishes that uh, we are able to provide according to our Kenyan constitution. And this is in line with this Article 53, Article 54, and Article 43 of the Kenyan constitution. Remember the women are the ones who carry the burdens when there is shortage of food, inadequacy of water, when there is poor shelter, they are the ones who carry the shame, they are the ones who carry the pain, they are the ones who carry all the burdens. And therefore their wish list number one, when I go to Mashinani today, the women will tell you, oh, Mwashimua, we are in the market and we don't have a, a good shade, you know, to nachomeka najua. When you go to them, they tell you, oh, my children are suffering of hunger. I don't have sufficient food. They're the ones who tell you, oh, I have disabled children. Like today I was providing wheelchairs to the disabled children or physically ch uh, challenged children in where I am from right now. I've given about four wheelchairs. And rarely will the men tell you that they have a disabled child in the house. Today, there's a, a woman who really literally cried telling me to go and see her two disabled twins in the house. So, so they wish that as we represent them, we try our best to make sure that we provide according to the constitution of Kenya and make sure that the socioeconomic rights, the rights to food, the right to shelter, to basic education, 
the right to provide for the physically challenged people, those rights are fulfilled. And of course, on top of that, as in line with the section, uh, with Article 53, women want money. They want money so that they can be able to meet their needs, like I've explained. And even when it comes to those women who want to represent, like I have heard there is a sister who wants to represent us in Kerinyaga. Karibu sana, my sister. Come, I hold your hand. It's tough there, but we make it by the grace of God. <laughs> but you cannot do it without money. Money is key in politics. Right now, Nimetoka Mashinani, I want to be very honest with you. I can't go to Mashinani without some money in my pocket. Honestly, I can't. Because there are people who believe that politics is an arena of money exchanging. And if you it's don't have money, even when there is no You guys are ATM right now, cards. You guys are ATM cards. Oh yeah, you have to make sure that you carry a, a, an ATM with you to be, to be <laughs> yeah, so to, to win it so in political. You, you are the ATM card. People see you, they see money, ATM. Of course, of course. In fact, they even ask you, you know, that's a language, the language of unasemaje, uh, kipesa, are you, cheza kama wewe, that is what wananiambia. You know, cheza kama wewe means, can you give us what you have? Because you are Muheshimiwa, and a Muheshimiwa should not have no money. Anyway, should not even be speaking a language of I have no money. And therefore, for those ladies and those sisters who want to get into the political campaign or political arena, I must tell you, and I will not lie to you, um, politics is a game of numbers. It's a game of competing numbers, and Kenyans' numbers are determined by how much money you have. That is for sure. You may be gifted like Gadoni, who is able to speak her way out. When I have no money, by the way, I still go to Mashinani and I'll still survive because I'm able to talk my way out. But not all of us are gifted that way. For me, I'll leave people cracking and I will drive off without giving them anything if I don't have. But I'm actually not. Okay. And I want to be very honest because they don't fight it out with the, with the Wanainchi. And the last and uh, the last wish, wish list for women, I'm talking about now the grassroots women, the, the last wish list is, is, is for them to be moved, to be escalated up. They want somebody who can be able to pull her up. I call it P-H-U, pull her up. A, a, a woman leader who would be able to hold the hands of those very weak, weak women, broke women, frustrated women, hopeless women, as uh, you know, women who come from very difficult uh, environments and, and backgrounds, and they want to be pulled up, and that is the mentorship yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, so, so they are looking towards us who are in parliament or those who are in political leadership like ourselves to be able to encourage them to come up in terms of you know moving from one ladder to the other. And that is why you okay. see, for us women leaders, we, we, we succeed very well when it comes to issues of women cohesive groups. Cohensive groups, I mean uh, women groups and chamas. Because yes. in those chamas, we are able to bring what I call group cohensivity, which goes line in line with, uh, with group uh, economic power. And I that really is where like what you're saying. And, and um, I want, I'm going to ask that in the next round. So just hold on to that. You've, you've actually now already, you, that, that's a very good thing that you've done to just really introduce us to the next set of questions. So just hold that thought, Mashimura. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, my one thing, and, and, one, and I really like one thing that you talk about, about human dignity. And I'm seeing from the uh, comments uh, so that people, there's someone who's agreeing with you about that. It's about human dignity really at the grassroots. Uh, Sonia Khan. Mm -hmm. You have been running a program um, that actually looks at, actually, I, I think we don't give Nyakan enough kudos because she's, she's actually been doing this kind of intersectionality because she brings, uh, she's been doing Timeless Women of Wanda since about 2015, an annual conference, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I've been very honored, privileged to be part of it. And it brings women from politics, it brings women from business, and it brings women from government, right? So Nyakan... I know that one of the programs that you do is uh, helping women financially. I know that that's, it appears that my, that is, seems to be the, the, like almost like the biggest uh, in terms of programmatic area, like the cornerstone. Um, and and I'm, 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 I wanna 
I'm bringing that out because on one hand, you could have the option of saying our, our, the, the most important thing to do is to, um, is to empower women politically or to empower women um, socially, but your ent entry point is through entrepreneurship. So I'm very interested in the thinking behind that. Is it that for you guys, because uh, I know it's a team, is it that entrepreneurship that once the financial and, and livelihoods part of things is solved is that that's when the politics and the and the social and by that we mean like relationships and marriages is that that is it that when the entrepreneurship when the when the livelihoods aspect of thing is sorted that everything else will be sorted or what was the thinking behind that yeah um thank you kingwa it's been su such an honor i mean it's it's so wonderful to be in, in great company um with my co-panelists because everything they're saying really speaks to the heart my heart and the heart of, of tiwao uh, the tamas women of wonder foundation um, again, uh, you just to answer your question, a TWAL, TWAL's vision is to transform Africa socially and economically. But Africa is not a wall. Africa is not a building. Africa is the people. And the people start at a family level, at a community level, at a country level, national level, up to, up to the continent and, and globally. And when you look at um, you know, development and sustainable development, you cannot ignore the matters of what uh, Madam Rahab has said, women need, need, need money, need, women need food. You know, Honorable uh, Gadoni has said dignity. You know, dignity is important. When we looked at the, the, the percentages, okay, of where women were at the CADA and the population of the continent, of course, breaking it down to countries, to communities, to counties, and things like that, you look at the percentage of of, 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 of society being over 50% women, number one. And when you look at the percentage of women, when you look at just women, and you look at the cadre, you look at the top cadre being only less than 3%, which means 80 to over 90% are women in mid and lower cadre. And when I say lower cadre, I mean lower income brackets, okay? So when you're looking at transformation, you have, you cannot ignore the largest, in, you know, um, uh, uh, demographic, which is our low income bracket. I mean, you're looking at development, you must then focus time, effort, resources, policies and everything to empower. So I do agree with all the women. They're talking about Mashinani, they're talking about the communities. That is where the heart of everything is. The second thing we looked at all the things that were prevalent in order to look at where Tiwa will play, all right? We looked at, um, you know, health issues, cultural issues, you know, the harmful cultural practices, you know, women going through FGM, women look, you know, dealing with HIV AIDS, women dealing with gender-based violence, women who don't have, have money at that, you know, you can see Honorable Gadoni saying every time she goes to the communities, they're asking, where is the money? What do you have for us, you know? And, and you know, you, you cannot ignore that plight because when a woman does not have money in her hand, the impact is very high because, you know, in that cadre of the community, they live with a microeconomy day by day. Okay, they pay school by day, they pay the, the lantern, the oil for the lantern per day. They look at extra money to take their children to, to hospital if they're sick at all by day, you get it. So the impact is very high when they don't have that money. When they ask for that money, what do you have for me today? It's very serious, okay? And then we did a research also. Where, what would a woman do if you give her 1,000 Kenya shillings? What would a man do if you gave him 1,000 Kenya shillings? And men at CEO level, mid and low, okay? All the men, the top level said, just fuel it or airtime it, you know? The mid man said, a bit of airtime, a bit of, you know, drink, a bit of nyamachoma and little, whatever remains to my family. The lower one was a bit of cigarette, a bit of nyamachoma, a bit, it all went to the man. The woman who's at the top with a thousand bob, it all went to her kitchen budget, which is a family. The oh, mid woman yeah. said a little bit to the kitchen, a little bit to the chama, a little bit to something. It is still family. The one at the lower cadre said Kido, immediately, Chama, you know, uh, pay the, 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 you know, more lantern food for the family, pay the fees for the day for the children. It all went to the family. So it made them sense that we must empower the women. Now, when we looked at all the HIV AIDS cultural things and everything as Tiwa, we said, look, if we, what can we do that will directly or indirectly impact the other people? Why do we have a lot of gender-based violence? I know that there's a lot of reasons and I give kudos and, and a lot of appreciation to those experts and I encourage them and we collaborate with them to do that. However, when you look at the stress levels, when there is no money, automatically the pressure on the man to provide, 
and every day being asked, there's no money for food, there's no money for children, and everything. That pressure leads to somebody just being slapped, you know? And we said, look, what if we can just be able to support women to, to create an economic livelihood so that they can also contribute as well, they can bring additional income to the family, then there would be perhaps some less stress levels. I do know that gender-based violence is a big conversation and it's attributed to many things, but our intervention is to look at you know, when you look at early, 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 early pregnancies and what, you know, marriages that are just random, you know, people get married as a way out of poverty, you know, the wrong reason, you understand? It is driven by economic hardships, you get it? And they're having unwanted pregnancies because they're just having sex, HIV AIDS, because they're just having sex for money, sex for fish, as, as uh, Honorable Easter was mentioning, you know? What can we do to support the women? So we decided, look, let's look at collectively bringing skills development in sectors that we call non-traditional sectors, okay? Which are generally stable and have a high potential to bring economic transformation to a family. And then I know this is controversial because this is a call of women leaders of, the, you know, of Kenya and we come from different places, but there is this saying that says anything a man can do, a woman can do better. Now, I know that's controversial here, okay? But in Tiwa, we believe that we're not in competition. I don't think it is. Reason, no, no, seems we need to bring that aspect, which is what a lot of the narratives on the, on the communities where we were at. You know, when you bring in a lot of economic independence to women, and they have the narrative that anything we can do, a, a man can do, a woman can do better, you go and disrupt, you know, while you're trying to do a good thing, which is increase the household income by empowering the woman economically, should she be earning a little bit more or much more than the man? And she has a narrative, anything a man can do, a woman can do better, that good thing we're doing results in more problems, which is more fights and gender-based wow. violence, okay? So one mm -hmm. of the things that we embedded in our programs was to look at life skills and narratives and mindsets, you know, and say, you know, you can be whatever you want to be, you, you. And then in your hand are, you know, your husband and children and a family and a community that you have the privilege to empower sustainably because of how women think based on the statistics. And three, when we do give you skills that allows you to earn an income, okay? It means that you're contributing as a partner to your household income, all right? So it's not competition, but collaboration. And so we've, we've trained over 24,500 women in Kenya with skills in the construction sector, because you know a lot of the women in the cadre that we're talking about earn between $0 to $3 a day. I'm telling you with the microeconomy, it is really, really low. You know, in terms of survival is really harsh. And then they get exposed to the things I was talking about, sex, you know, uh, you know, uh, wow. you know for, for everything, for fish, for, for, for work, for livelihood, for everything. And then HIV, AIDS, and gender, based, all those things come. So we looked and saw that in the construction sector, there is a high, high, high probability of increasing the household income from $3 to $15 a day because a painter, a roofer, a tiler, a mason, a plumber, an electrician, once skilled and trained, by the way, the minimal money that you can earn is 1,500 shillings per day, which is $15 a day. And that is significant transformation for the quality of life, quality of nutrition and health. You know, the dignity that, that Rehab and Honorable Gadoni are talking about. The woman now is dignified. She has money in her pocket for her children, for food, for, you know, the day-to-day -day expenses. Mm -hmm. And she suddenly, her self-esteem begins to improve. The stress levels in the house decrease, you know? Mm -hmm. And then they can move into contractors and things like that. So I do agree with Madam Rahab. Economic empowerment is so critical, okay, for women in general. Because again, a lot of our political leaders, or Gadoni, I, you know, I, I, I support you and challenge you, you know, to, to now let us look at to get a strategy. Because the more we are asking like this, politicians to hand out, yeah, the more our politics will be geared by who's giving the most money, all right? But the more we equip people economically to, to, to stand on their own two feet, the more they can make better decisions that are not being blackmailed, you, you understand? So these are some of the contributions that, that, that I have. And the, the other thing, sorry, I'm about to just finish is to say, oh, that, yeah, is to say that, so let us open the spaces for, for young women. Let us know that the, it's, the cake is big. Let us open it up. There is so much fresh thinking and inhibition, great talent and leadership that young people can bring to the table. Let us be confident enough to open up these spaces and mentor. Honorable Gardoni, I'm so grateful that we are this call together as a chair of 
Kenya Women Parliamentary Association. Let us not wait for 2022, 2027 to be seeing who we are helping. How can we mentor and have hundreds of thousands of women already on the wings, young women, that we can start to show the ropes so that when time for election comes, you know, with the structures that Madam Rahab and others have, we can start to then open up the spaces for them to come into leadership early, okay? And then lastly is values, values. Can we be leaders of values? Women are held to a higher moral account, just generally. So they have it harder in the political space. I think it's Easter who was talking about that. We, we, we are, we, it's harder for women. We are, held to, we are held to so much higher account on moral, on, on our morals, you know? So when a woman is hit, she's hit so hard. And she, you know, the whole world is seeing that she's going to survive. Other women are, are watching how that woman is surviving. And depending on how we react, I think that women, we need to be, we need to be kinder to the, and support the women who are already in politics. You know, yes. let us a support system that will support those who are already in there. So that should they make a mistake, let's not be the first ones pointing the fingers. Let us offer support. They may not have done right, right things or whatever, but can we offer support and help them to stand up again? Because there were so few, if we then hit and not support those who are being hit, the, 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 the scene is, is, is a very rough scene. You know, and then I'm asking myself, are we regressing or are we progressing? When you look at African setup of leadership, there was always a women council, which means even the original structure recognized the role that women were playing in running the day-to-day -day things of, of, of Africa. You know, so mm -hmm. the women council existed. Uh, what is it that they did that they were able to be respected without trying to fight so hard that we need to figure out, you know? So I'm, I'm happy to hear, you know, just from this call, you know, um, the great leaders that we have, you know, our, our audience and, and, and the panelists. Let, let's see, what were they doing right that they didn't have to fight so hard for space, that there was a women council that the men sought their opinion yeah. before they made decisions. I'm seeing, I'm no. seeing Lucy Odiambo agree, agreeing with you. She says, yes, Nyakan, young minds are ripe with great ideas and zeal to do things right. Um, I also see Evelyn Komba saying, I like the current speaker, Nyakan. She's in touch with reality. She's on the ground. She knows, she understands. Easter has talked about mentorship. Awar has pointed out on matters of inclusion. Um, Nyakan, like every time I tell you, you're, you're a genius, like super, super brilliant, brilliant. So thank you. Those are, those are very, very powerful thoughts. And um, I, I'm actually now interested in also this, those studies that you talk about. Maybe we could, because uh, I think such, such such kind of things need to, publi to be publicized, to get wider, um, wider reach, both in the space and national, even with the mainstream media. So we can talk separately and just figure how to, because I'm very interested and I like, I like, yeah, like I think you, you ask the right questions, you have the right frame. So thank you for that. Um, so Easter, for you, what has, what has been the thing that has um, informed your approach with your organization? What is, what is, what is the thing that has um, what was the reason for the particular focus on what Kefiando focuses on? One thing is that uh, we come from not an urban area. So one of the things we are looking at, we are looking at an African feminist approach. And in an African feminist approach, which looks at uh, bringing inclusion and bringing voices, that is what uh, uh, informs the, the way we are engaging. Because um, in the areas where we work in the Western Kenya region, the, the issues of the FGM, which has been mentioned there, the issues of um, they use, the people talk about white inheritance, but the context of white inheritance and choices is not something which people talk about. The, we are influenced by the way we talk about gender identity and sexuality of women's ability to choose who is your partner and your sexuality. So part of those are, is what we influences how we are engaging. And we are also looking at the people who are left behind. We are talking about women with disability and girls with disability because we work in schools and learning institutions. So part of it, our work is informed by those who are often left out of the table. So when you're talking about um, having conversations or bringing people to the table, we are looking at who do we often leave out at the table? People are mentioning young women, but we look at them when we talk about young women, what is the young woman you are speaking about? Is this the young woman in an urban area who is able to engage in all different spaces? Or is this this young woman in some island in Mageta in a rural area who has never even heard what a Zoom call is? So part of it is that how do we create spaces where people can engage in their own comfort zones? 
So those spaces of conversations, those spaces of convergence, those spaces where we are able to then bring uh, and make these conversations easy to engage on is something which we look at. We are asked, uh, somebody asked that there are spaces which used to exist. Yes, in the low cultural practice, we had what we call Sivindi, where people could, young women and girls could be able to get to speak. But one of the challenges we are facing now that- um, Sorry, what was the name again? Say that again. Siwinde, Siwinde. Okay. in the local cultural practice. And they exist in all African cultural practices where you'd be able to have space to organize and speak about yourself. When you're talking about low women and women as elders, one of the challenges we are asking ourselves that what happened to the African cultural practice where no woman is an elder with a voice? Women would be able to speak. We have the issues of the cultural practices where women would either engage in war or stop war. So one of the things is that we have to really look at writing or re-looking at our histories and looking at the position of women where they actually existed. Because all the patriarchy means that the, our historical narratives have excluded women who did stuff. When we look at even in our own um, Kenyan context, when we look at women who have done quite a bit in the political arena, you will count them in one finger. Yet there are women who are able to ensure that the political movements existed. There have been women who have shaped conversations at different levels. So for me, one of the things which you're looking at is that we are, as an institution, we're looking at rewriting history and correcting what history tells about how women and young women and girls have also influenced whatever it is that you're talking about. As an institution, we have decided that in Western Kenya, we want to have a, a bigger voice, a more intersectional voice, where we talk about the issues of gender and diversity. Because once we speak about women, let us not be homogeneous in the way we describe who our women are. We have women who are from gender minorities. Do we ever speak with them? Do we ever bring them to the table? Their experiences are very different. So our homogeneity in the way we look at women is what then ensures that sometimes we have that one shoe fits all, which never fits us all in wherever we are. So if we start having a conversation where we look at um, the different faces of women and girls, wherever they come from, then I think then we we'll should then we'll have more voices coming out and more voices being listened to and move the um, conversation. We often say that too many conversations happen in Nairobi. We need to move conversations from Nairobi and engage at other levels. If we move those conversations from the, the cities and go to speak with these people where they are, then we will have a very robust movement. So for me, what we look at is the intersectional movements. As I said earlier, what are women in labor saying? What are women in politics saying? What are women who are in uh, their social spaces saying? If we start having these conversations, then we'll have um, a more robust way of engaging with different platforms. So one of the challenges which we have, have we been able to ensure that this is, is consistently done or we only wait for during the political processes? Right now in Kenya, we are talking about economic justice and economic recovery. How many of us are speaking about the women who have lost work? How many of us are tasking governments to ensure that the economic justice for women who have lost work, whether you're in a, doing horticulture, whether you're in a salon, whether you're wherever you are, who is asking those questions? In the economic recovery package that was given by the president, we talked about it. Who is talking about the recovery package post COVID? So part of the conversations which we must have is that as women, I think the way we work has consistently left people behind because of the homogeneous nature in which we think women are. Unless we start looking at the issues of gender diversity and ensuring inclusion, then we'll be able to then change the way people think. For example, one of the things we always think of that when you talk about the issues of disability is that when you're talking about women of disability, you'll bring one person of physical handicap. We have women with different disabilities who are supposed to be sitting on the table. And as I'm looking at what people are saying, I hope that the next time we are talking about, we'll even have a sign language interpreter to include women who have hearing impairment, to include the, so that our conversations are different. So part of it is that I think that in terms of how we need to engage, we need to be more inclusive even for us in our own different movements and then get the voices of other people who are constantly left out. And then we are looking at the young, but we are also looking at the elderly. When you grow, all of us are growing older. As we grow older, there's an age where there are certain things that we require. 
We talk about the health systems. How do we then ensure that the reproductive health needs of the different persons where we, look, we are engaging are actually looked into? So what I would also look at is that in terms of our agenda setting, yeah. we have to look at influencing budgets. I look at the money. Part of the work that Kefiado does is influencing budgets so that we have gender responsive budgets. And when we have gender responsive budgets, we have to track those budgets and ensure they're implemented because that is our tax. So as a taxpayer, whether you're at the county level or whether you're at the national level, what is our tax doing? We are currently getting into the new year of budgets. One of the challenges that we have faced because of the multiple roles of a woman, you are never able to participate in the budget making processes. So when national governments and county governments are actually doing their plans, anything which is related to what women want never get into that budget. So part of the conversation which we are having is that disrupt those spaces, disrupt the spaces and ensure that our agenda is on the table because we all pay tax. We are all people who are Kenyans. You are registered or if you are naturalized or you contribute to this particular space. So the conversations which you must have is that follow the money and ensure that the money works for us. So if you're able to follow that money and share this knowledge at different levels, then I think that we'll be able to then start shaping our agenda at a different uh, at, at different spaces. And All if right. this one is done, then we'll be able to engage intersectional, intersectional feminism. That is what will work. It will ensure you know that what, everybody is there. Really, one thing that I admire about what you guys do is that you, first of all, you, you very, you, you center, you center the term fem, the feminist, feminism. Um, yeah. That, and I say that, and that's important because we are at a time, like I had mentioned earlier, the word, the term feminist right now is an evil word, but you are there like, move, move, move aside world. I said feminist, you had me right. So I like that. And also I think, I think one of your strengths, one of the strengths of what you're doing, even just to contextualize, um, even with this group is that you have a strong, um philosophical and like you're very grounded philosophically even the what you're talking about about the history and documenting um and documentation and writing histories is something that daisy amdani naomi barasa uh, have talked about previously um yeah so, so just noticing that that even in the women's constituency okay now just to get a bit philosophical um if there's a body mind soul um so it's like you're at the at the mind level you're helping us think through what is it exactly that we're doing? What is the framework? And I like that you talked about that the thing that we are fighting is actually patriarchy. So I like that. And then on the other hand, we have someone like um, Reha Bart Mandeleo and what they're doing is like very much dealing with the, the body part of things there. You know, the very, the grounded like food, water kind of things. And then um, uh, we have like uh, uh, Mashmiwa, who's like as in, in politics, so, sort of in the middle, um, in terms of trying to change the everyday reality. So like, yeah, so body, mind, soul. So uh, you're actually at soul level, Nyakan probably mind level, um, uh, Mindeleo probably at body level. Yeah, so just to say that. Uh, and yes, your focus on inclusiveness. I think that's, that's a strong thing and that's something that a lot of us can learn from. Uh, so now I'll go to, we'll go to Rehab. Uh, Madam Rehab, uh, maybe you can tell us about some of the programs that Mindelo is currently running. I know that you told me that you have, you've been in this COVID time, you've been around the country, and you were those the very big case that you were dealing with of uh, the teenage pregnancies. But even outside of that, what are the, we'd be interested to hear the actual programs and focus areas that Mindelo is dealing with right now, and and what informs us. And and just having all of you talk about what your organizations are doing is important because. You can then figure out areas of convergence. You can then figure out where you can plug into each other. So yes, uh, just happy to hear from you, Madam Rehab. Yeah, thank you, Kigwa. With half an hour to go, I think this may be my last. So I'll take a few more, probably five, 10 minutes and touch a few things I probably did not talk about. Uh, before we talk about what Mandeleo is doing, I want to touch a bit about the speakers who have just spoken. And I want to talk about um, the responsibility of women in the African context. Because we are talking about business, entrepreneurship, and I want to be very honest here. Maendeleo is grassroots, it's old, and we look at it as custodians of the family. Even if I were to 
you won't hear me in the feminism talk. I give my sisters credit for that. But I'll look at it in the African context because that is who we are. Now, what has made the African woman do business and succeed? Because in Kenya, we do have women who have done very well in business. Uh, it takes most of these women, if they are married, it takes a husband to support you. Then your business is very successful because the man comes along with you. It even takes husbands sometimes in the political arena, people like Mama Mugo, there's a story where Mama Phoebe is very clear. These are my predecessors, that she is the one who asked Mama Beth, and I'm seeing this on, on, you know, on air, mm -hmm. asked Mama Beth's husband that Beth should join politics. She has what it takes. And so she walks along with her husband saying yes. So I want us not to lose the fact that Yes, we do have very many single parent uh, women in Kenya who have been very successful, but we've also had Africa being what it is, a lot of support from husbands. I ran my business for three decades and export business because my husband allowed me to go abroad. He also supported me in my endeleo to be where I've come all along the way, use family money because it's a voluntary organization. So what am I saying? This journey of empowering a Kenyan woman we must look at it completely because this is where we are. It's a patriarchal society. We are not going to change from that so that we do not misadvise the girl because when I got into business, I was, I, I think I was 27 years. I'm 64 today. And when everybody thought, what is she talking about boarding a plane? My husband was like, just go ahead because he was an airliner and he didn't see anything wrong with flying. That's what he did. So it takes a family. So let's tag the family in this thing. Having said that, let us go to um, what do we need to do? When I was in Meru with the minister and in Tarakanidi like three weeks ago, Professor Kobia, she said, you know, there was all this story of the girls getting pregnant and we were all talking about it. And she said, as a professor in her line, when everyone is in something, then no one is in it. I would like us to see what is the one thing as women of Kenya, whether in Mandalay, whether it's in, in Kiwopa and uh, you know where my sister Wamushomba is, whether it is the women in Chas Mother Siro you know, Nama member, the women in the car, what is this one thing we can agree that Kenyan women are going to do? And I want us to say we are going to agree for me, my proposal with very humbly is poverty at the grassroots. The disparities are very high. This is the one thing we can agree that if God gives us life post, uh, after COVID, we really must deal with poverty. And there I come into what is Mindeleo doing. Mindeleo, as you know, is an old woman. Sorry, I want to make this more, sorry, madam, for to interrupt you, but uh, just because you asked a question to the participants. Mm -hmm. So guys, just also, just maybe respond to that. She asked, um, what is the one thing that you think needs to be done? And she we can suggested, that, do. yes, that we should do together. I like that you're making it even more unitary and uh, action oriented. So so participants, I'd be interested to hear you your answer that um, uh, she suggested poverty at the grassroots, uh, that's the key thing that we need to focus on. So guys, just type in your answers. Um, and then, I'll, sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I'll allow you to continue, Rehab, and then we'll go to- Thank you. Uh, now, I want to come to the issue on role models. We really, the journey, some of us walked, there was somebody there you looked up, up to. So all of us leaders, when we are either on the screens or in our lives, what do people see in us? What do people hear us say? I've been very concerned about the killings of young families, a boy and a girl. They just knife one another. And it comes to me, maybe it's things we say on the screens, and then people in Kibera become victims. A man tells a poor girl, you are not going to be talking to me like the way that woman was talking. So are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the wrong thing? It's a question I'm posing to all of us. The issue of values. Anybody over 60 like me, surely there were values our time. If your mother told you something or your father, you listened. And those who did not have parents, the community took responsibility. So some of us are grandparents. What are we doing with our grandchildren? The issue to go back, and I'm going out of what you want me to talk, Kiwa, but because this is a forum, the thing to say, grandparents, grandmothers, walk with your grandchildren. Talk with the children who do not have the advantage you have yourself as a grandmother because we have a responsibility of the community. And I am talking from the community. That Nairobi, we must leave it. I agree with the lady from Western. I agree with her absolutely. We must do business at the grassroots. The issue of uh, 
leadership. We must agree that leadership has sure. a lot Actually, of- Actually, Madam, what would be interesting if you could share with us like the actual programs that Mendeleo is running. Go straight there. So what Mendeleo does, but I must finish by saying, as a leader, you must sacrifice. It is servant leadership. It is not what is there for Kigwa or what is there for Rahab. There will be something for you. There will be something you are paid. But bottom line, what legacy do you leave? And I'm saying that when I'm in a very interesting institution where I've gone through a lot of things, but yet I come to water. Mandelio launched a water project last year in Kajado. And uh, we are partnering, we signed an MOU with, uh, with, a, uh, you know, with a manufacturer of, uh, of water tanks and with a, a, a company called Musoni. Currently, we are starting negotiations with government, uh, Women Enterprise Fund, because we've lobbied the government and said they have cheaper money at Women Enterprise Fund. And I think the minister had us, and we are, my team will be sitting, I think, tomorrow yeah. with a committee, the, the, you know, a technical team. So we are doing water tanks. So when I say we did it in Kajando, we have that now currently we are doing it in, in, in Homa Bay. Meru, Governor Kiraitu, has given women. He's going to buy water tanks worth 30 million in Meru. Mamangilo is going to be doing about 10 million in Kitui. I have a promise holding with the governor, governor, governor Makoweni. We are also planting trees. And Leo started a, a, you know, a project on, on, on tree planting. We signed with the Green Movement last year and we started planting trees even where I am, I've been doing my, you know, my, my, my planting of trees. And when many women are doing it in their villages. And so for us, we underline grassroots because that is where we encourage and that is where we are. Having said that, we are very concerned about the girl pregnancies. Somebody has said, they have talked about, uh, nobody has talked about the money, the COVID and all that. Mandelio has been online talking about this. When His Excellency gave the money, we have been trying to lobby for some of that money. COVID now and after COVID. So yes, we are concerned and we are thinking of daycare centers for the children because there are many, we are going to have very many children coming up from children because the mothers are 15 years come uh, beginning of the year and in the, in the time end of this year. Now, somebody spoke about what used to happen many years ago. I want to say with our constitution, you can get a copy tomorrow if you go to my Andaleo house, we have a council of the wise. The Council of the Wise in Mandeleo is handed by the founder of the institution, uh, Dr. Phoebe Asiyo, who is our patron. And I want to pay great tribute to my predecessors in Mandeleo, the founders, all of them, Mama Asiyo, the late Mama Keano, Professor Ojambu, Mama Kambeberi, Shitaha, Mujoba, all of them. And all the chairs who have come there, Zibora Kitoni, Ambassador Rukia, my predecessors, and all the other leaders. And see, Mandeleo has been passing on the baton so for me, if you want to see where a baton is passed, it happens in mind. Leo. We have a council of the wise, which is talking, which is going to be, we, we, you know, we dealt with the names last week and it is handed by Mama CEO. She's in the US as soon as she's back. Mama Phoebe is in the council of the Lugo. I want to tell my sister from Western, Mama Phoebe sits in the Lugo Council of Elders. I sit in the Kamba Council of the Elders. So there are women who sit in these councils. The different thing here, there are women who may really be known what they are doing because they are always on TV. There are people who are not on TV very often. This is not the way probably they do their business. Maybe you should be telling us to come on TV and say some of these things we are doing. Because like, I know Mama Phoebe has been in the council for a long time. I sit in the council of Kamba Elders for quite some time. So there are women sitting in these councils. They may not talk about it. So you need to fish them out. So finally, I want to say that uh, Mandelio is also launching a Swahili constitution by end of this month. It is the first time we are giving a Swahili constitution. So in another, by next week, we can give you our constitution from tomorrow. We'll give you a strategic plan 2019, 2024, and we give you a Swahili translation because we've realized majority of the girls who are uneducated need to read this constitution, need to be our members. So when we talk about cottage industries, it is real because we have the numbers at the grassroots. I don't think I have a lot of time but uh, for now, I can't stop there, Kiwa. Thank All you. right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to read uh, the feedback. Uh, so Rosemary Musumba says, wow, most of the panelists have their own organization doing very well. Can we get Mindelio to lead by bringing these organizations and others together to harness these issues? Jokiwa Mai says, 
Jukiwa Mai says, poverty, yes, but that's what Maendeleo does. Let other women address power relations and others something else. We need a multifaceted approach, interesting perspectives. And that's in response to the, uh, to the question that uh, uh, Rehab, that you had asked about the one thing that we can agree on. Um, and then we also have, uh, yes, Dr. Pacifica Okemwa, yes, community day daycare centers entrenched in county governance. Dr. Litha says in another webinar, okay. Um, Tembisile Putego, I'm probably massacring your name, but she says, empower women in the grassroots. Lucy Odembo says, oh no, I had read that earlier. Hezbon Kola says, my view is that women in the village need more mentorship, especially to boost their self-esteem. Most of these women were married early when they were very young. Most of them feel incapable to make decisions. Once the mm. self-esteem is sorted mm. out, they can make it economically. And um, Pauline says, this is a very rich conversation. I, I appreciate all the organizers and panelists. Thank you, Nyakan, for recognizing we have different levels of women representation. One of those levels is grassroots. In the political world, they refer to this as Wanjiko. Uh, Lizelle Maurice says, agreed, our young women need a hand-holding process. Young people have some really great ideas. Let's include them as well. Uh, Kondwani says, let us be women of values. Wanjiko Mbogwa says, women, is this Wanjiko Mbogwa who was at Heinrich Ball that ran the, the women and gender program? Just type in and let me know if it's you, Wanjiko, kindly. Um, she says, women know what they want. It's just that no one really asks them. And when some do, they get little, e.g. two-thirds gender rule. They have agency, great abilities. They nurture and manage the nation, children, leaders, environment successfully, and ensure the country runs. Their dignity is in it as human beings, but it's taken away by, among others, harmful cultural practices and abuse in both private and public spaces. Um, and then Rosemary Musumba Honrabhab, Great insights as always, Karibu, New York. I can't wait to host you for a side event during CSW, let's side chat. Our <laughs> Ponga says, thank you so much for the panelists, so far so good. Uh, one critical concern, I did some work on participation of young women in political processes. This was done in 2012 for the youth agenda. The youth, the issue of mentorship was really key. Um, so yes, we talk about mentorship. So uh, just as we, as we now go to Moshimiwa, I just wanna say thank you very much, Madam Rehab. And uh, I, really, I, I, I like that you have come in your fullness as my Ndeloya Wanawake, um, especially bringing in the issue of family values, because I think it's something that we, we don't talk a lot, a lot about, especially in the contemporary uh, feminist organizing. Um, and it reminds me of what Nyakan was talking about, the way that they had set up their program to make sure that it does not just leave women empowered and then and then like sort of like and then disrupt families because that's always been a thing a dicey thing so so yeah so thank you for that and for you and really for just talking to us I felt very encouraged I felt that uh, uh, you're a good mentorship figure for all of us so thank you for sharing so uh, kindly so now Moshimiwa um, you've, you've gotten a lot of love. Everyone has said how they're going to support you with your programs. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that on a, on a bit of a, uh, uh, on a bit of a, so on a light note, but just really the concept of how we are at a time when we are all recognizing that it can no longer be the time of, div of division and, and putting each other down, but instead um, pulling her up. I don't know if it was Easter or, or, or it was, uh, I think it was Easter who talked about that, pulling her up. So know. you are, oh, it was actually you who talked about it. Thank you, thank yeah, you, Nika. Yeah. So you are, newly elected chair of uh, Kewopa, the Kenya Women Parliamentarians Association. You, uh, you, have, a big, you have a constituency under you. Um, um, in fact, you could decide to brag and call yourself the most powerful woman in the country because you have all the MPs and governors and senators uh, under you. Um, but it would be interesting to hear about what are you planning moving forward and because that would also then also answer the question that everyone else has been asking, the question of, of, of really getting on board and giving support. What is it that you have planned um, as Kawapa, or maybe because it's still something new, because I think it was either early this, this month or last month, the election. Thank, thank you very much, my sister. Thank you. And 
When was the election? It's about uh, one and a month, one and a half months ago. Okay, so so the, what I'm trying to uh, now what I want to bring out is just to, for you to share what are the programs that you want to engage in moving forward. Um, what is informing this this the focus area of these programs, and how can people that want to get involved to participate if they want to volunteer, give support? Yeah, so you could. And so I that, that also cut you short before. So if you had held that stream of thought, kindly do get back into it. Thank you very much. I was happy that you asked me to hold my thoughts uh, at that juncture so that I can get home. Now I'm home. Uh, of course, I was on the road and it was a little bumpy. Um, I'm excited to hear my chair of Maendeleo Wanawake speak because, you know, um, when I was growing up as a small girl, I looked forward into women leadership uh, uh, arena and indeed joined Maendeleo Wanawake when I was, uh, I think, 23 years old and struggled very much to get a lifetime membership certificate uh, because I believed that uh, if you want to go up in the leadership, you have to start from the grassroots and then the grass, grassroots opportunity for women leadership was strongly or, uh, in Mindeleo. So thank you, my sister and my chair, and I hope that uh, your programs are going to reach out even to Kewapa so that we can work together and especially on those programs that touches on the women on the grassroots. Uh, Kigwa, your questions are many, but I want first of all to answer my chair, my chair, Maendeleo. She asked, what is it that we must agree all of us as women to do? And I think for me, like I had said, we must agree that all of us in our own capacity, because women leadership seems to be an elite uh, space in Kenya. I mean, it's, it's a space for the elite women. Uh, most of the women who are in positions of leadership are women who at one point went to school, at one point worked it somewhere, led an organization or act, played an active role in the managerial position. And therefore, what we need to do to make sure that we are felt as women leaders is to dignify the lives of women of Kenya. That we must do. My chair has ably put it that... Uh, the one way of dignifying our women's life and livelihood is by eradicating poverty, which I agree. But the other aspect of dignifying women's life in Kenya, one, I believe in sisterhood because sisterhood is powerful. When we have sisterhood and our sisterhood is powerful, that brings together the women movement. And I'm very happy with what your organization is doing, Madam Moderator, because I think um, you are trying to bring back the woman movement in terms of this kind of discussions you are having. And once we have the sisterhood with us, I believe sisterhood is powerful. With that power, we can be able to um, influence bills in the National Assembly, in the Senate, in the country assembly, uh, only if when we have that cohesivity within the spirit of sisterhood. Number two, once we are able to dignify our women, we'll be able to eradicate some of the vices that erode their dignity. For example, areas of issues of SGBV, sexual assault, sexual violence, domestic violence, workplace violence, you know, once we are able to identify areas that erode our women's dignity, then we'll be able to create a, a, a hedge around the sisterhood that can always protect each other, can always fight for one another, can always support you know, areas of growth and positive development other than negative development. And in the same, same arena, once we are able to come together as sisters and create this sisterhood spirit, we would be able to create our own political space. And I want to say this very clearly without fear of contradiction. Politics is a game of numbers. If we have to win it, we have to have numbers. Look at how much we have struggled to have the two thirds uh, principal gender rule in the National Assembly go through. It's because we have not had the numbers. And even the few numbers that we have had, we have not been cohesive enough. We have not been speaking the same language. Look at what is happening today with the, two, with the issues of CRA revenue share. You can see the women are not speaking together because there's not that sisterhood. There is not that cohesiveness. Now, for me as the new chair of Kewapa, my business is to bring unity uh, to the women. My business is to unite women. My business is to unite women so that we can be able to achieve the three main agenda that we have to achieve soon and very soon. One, 
we must make sure that the women common agenda is included in the new CRA formula. The common women agenda is included in the new BBI and the common women agenda is included in the passing of the bills that have been pending in the National Assembly and in the Senate. There's one speaker who has mentioned that we have a serious gap with issues of teenage pregnancy. Right now, even me as a county woman MP for Kiambu, if there's an issue I'm struggling with right now is the issue of teenage motherhood. Teenage motherhood is a huge, huge problem that we are yet to experience because for your information, the teenagers that are becoming mom in the month of uh, August, those are the teenagers that conceived in the month of October, November last year. We are yet to experience oh new God. births of the teenagers that have conceived during COVID. And I can tell you, the numbers are going to skyrocket. That is a problem. For me, my agenda is to make sure all women lawmakers play their role, one, provide intervention for the teenagers, make legislation that is going to make sure that we cover up for the gaps that are existing and ensure that we have a policy for school re-entry because this early motherhood, this teenage motherhood, if it is not um, rescued, if the mothers are not rescued and back to school, then we'll have a, a cycle of poverty that is going to start flowing in our country and it's going to even get worse. And therefore, my, 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 my immediate uh, um, activity is to make sure that we, we liaise with the executive, liaise with the National Assembly and the Senate, make sure that the right laws are made. And I am aware that we already have a bill, a teenage pregnancy bill that is coming from the Senate. Honorable Senator Kwamboka, Beatrice, is, is, is actually struggling with the, with the bill. We also need to make sure that we support her so that that bill can go through. And once it comes to the National Assembly, as, as the women of the National Assembly, I believe we are going to make sure um, that we support her. We also need to look at the loopholes that are, 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 are catalyzing issues of SGPV. And we all know in Kenya, we have a serious loophole in our, in our sexual assault bill that we passed in the year 2006. I am humbled to report that uh, already I have brought an amendment uh, to the Sexual Offenses um, uh, Act 2006. Oh, well done. And thank you very much. And I request for your support as ladies and leaders, because these amendments are going to help us to make sure that the loopholes that have been there, you know very well that our evidence um, out of uh, assaults and rapes, our, our evidences and uh, our exhibits have been disappearing and the files have been disappearing at some point. And some of the cases take forever to be executed because, oh, the policeman cannot be able to find the exhibit, or oh, the file cannot be tra tracked where it is, uh, the prosecutor does not know which file to start with, all those stories. So I'm bringing up amendment. It's really a heavy amendment, and I'm excited that uh, it has gone to the government printers, and therefore, once we resume in September, we shall have uh, the bill uh, debated for the first reading and the second reading. Um, my work is to make sure that any other member of parliament that has a pending bill that uh, touches on the family, for example, we have the family bill, we have the, with the widow's bill, we have the children act that needs to be, uh, be reviewed and amended. Any bill that is pending that touches on issues to do with the common women agenda. Uh, my business is to make sure that I whip the members and uh, give leadership to make sure that those bills go through. Last but not least, we have not yet given up on the two-thirds gender rule principle. We have not given up because we have, uh, we have had serious lobbying happening. By the way, for the last one month, since I was elected, every single week, we have ministers meeting, meeting cabinet secretaries. We have met Mweshimiwa Kobia, our minister for gender. We have met uh, Fred Matiangi, minister for interior, uh, interior and uh, coordination of national government. We have met CS Magoha on issues of teenage pregnancy and also making sure that we are also lobbying them so that we can be accommodated because the issue of two-third gender rule principle is a sensitive issue. It's a co unconstitutional right now and we must make sure that we make it pass. But unfortunately, and I want to say this without a fear of contradiction, the issue mm -hmm. of two-third gender rule principle was taken to be a women issue, mm -hmm. unfortunately. 
and now how to unpack that and make it a general gender issue is 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 the elephant in the room men think that the issue of two third gender rule is is a matter of taking favoring women and making sure that women get opportunities into government offices into political spaces and there and so on and so forth yeah. and therefore we saw that happening in the national assembly unfortunately it was not well packaged we do hope that uh, through the many lobbying that we are doing and the meetings that we are handling we'll be able to unpack that and pack it properly so that it can pass but i can tell you for sure i can tell you that for sure two-thirds gender rule must pass without a fear thank of you. thank you thank you Moshimiwa. thank you for all your hard work and your spirit of moving forward and i like that you brought out the concept of sisterhood naomi barasa naomi barasa i think a lot of us know Naomi. She's she's one person who talks a lot about sisterhood, about the importance of sisterhood, and that it is a missing link. So I think, I think that even after these discussions, we do need to be reaching out. Even after this, um, like for example, one observation that I've made is that the total gender rule is is women at a certain econ. I'm wondering how to frame this, but that there's a way in which the two-third gender has not fully been bought by uh, has not fully been bought by all women um, because of patriarchy um, and 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 and, and the, the the propaganda that men have been using that it's only that this two-third gender is only going to favor the elite women unfortunately has 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 been bought by women themselves and so that's been taken up so it's there's an opportunity a very big opportunity to take this message down to the grassroots. Um, and, and yeah, places where Kina Easter and, uh, and Rehab are, are very strong. So there's a very, very strong opportunity on that. And I hope you guys can be able to reach out to each other. Um, so yes, so just talking about that. Um, and now that we have, and now that we are actually at this point where we are just six minutes to go, uh, I think this has been a very, very good discussion. I feel that it's been nice and easy and uh, we've been able to just tease out the issues. We've been able to tease out the question of what is it that women want? And we've had the voices from different perspectives, from different sides of the coin, or not, not the coin, but of the, uh, maybe the elephant is the best analogy. So yeah, which, which has been very, very useful and very, very helpful. Um, I don't know, I, 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 would, I, I don't know if I will say for sure that we have come up to an, a particular agreement um, that this is the one thing that we need to do moving forward. I, maybe it would be overstepping my reach and my mandate and my privileges trying to claim that. <laughs> and then the next day people are like, eh, no, I was not part of that. I did not co-sign to that. But I think it's, it's, this has been very good to begin with. I mean, just the opportunity to, net, to network and the opportunity to see where the gaps are, um, where the gaps are. So I'm just, just gonna read one or two last comments and then I'll give the panelists uh, an opportunity to just say one last word. And then unfortunately, we'll have to bring this uh, very delightful conversation to a close. Um, Wanja, Wanja, Wanja Knighton asks, she says, servant leadership, as mentioned by Mama Rahab, was so evident with women who fought in the 80s, 90s. Remember Freedom Corner mothers? Why are women in parliament today um, so perfectly, or she asks, so perfectly imperfecting their punch in parliament in implementing change for matters concerning women? Was there no mentoring happening there? Can the panel mentor future leaders? Uh, yeah, so when I had asked this question earlier, but I think I think uh, Gadoni might have just been able to share some of the things that have been happening in Parliament and what, some of the things that they are trying to do. So thank you so much for that question, Wanja, and also that you bring out the, the issue of mentorship, and that's also coming out from the other um, from the other participants in the chat. The whole question of uh, mentorship. Nerea Okech says resources should follow the argument that conversations must happen at grassroots. Sadly, most resources are tied up at national level. But Honorable Gadoni, the two-third gender rule has no political goodwill. We must simply go out to the field and compete to level the decision-making table. So lastly, just to give every, all of you, okay, first of all, to thank you, and then maybe to give you, uh, our panelists, an opportunity to just one word, parting shot, as we move, as we leave, what is the one? What is the one thing that we need to go thinking about? 
in your view. So we can start with uh, Nyakani. Yeah. Um... I don't know about one word, Kingo, but I know. You have <laughs> I know. <laughs> and the others have to talk. So I think I'll just do bullets and that's collaboration. I think we need to collaborate more. That intersectionality, working together, bringing government's development, private sector and development together. I think it's critical. I think the role of men cannot be underscored in anything to do with women inclusion, women empowerment, women in the political space and all other spaces. I think the role that men play as bridges I think is very critical. I think economic empowerment is ap absolutely critical, okay, in, in order for us to be able to achieve the, the, the goals that we are, we are, we are shooting out for. Uh, political goodwill at the highest level is important and our mindsets, I leave us with mindsets. You know, we need a mindset of abundance, not a mindset of scarcity. And we need to really look at the mindsets that we are, we, we're coming to the table with at every given time including this COVID time, we can see it as at the time of pressure and storms, or we can use a storm to ride high. Thank you so Thank much, Kinga, for, for allowing Thank me to call. Thank you for coming. So, so honored, always honored to listen to you. You are an immense mental resource all the time. Uh, Easter, what's the part, what one, what, what one word, what, what one thing do we do? Would you like us to go to leave thinking about keeping in mind? Intersectional and intergenerational movements, which will then ensure that we have cross movements between the younger, older, rural, and all these spaces. If we start having these conversations now and bring in inclusion and diversity, then we will not leave people behind. So that bit of leaving people behind is what must end. Let's go cross movement, do movement building, and we must be very passionate and deliberate about it uh, so that we can then um, uh, make the speed of how things work um, and um, that will work for me yes okay thank you so much and your work is so renowned I had of you before I even talked to you so I honor you and I just encourage you to keep on doing the good work that you're doing um, wish me we're parting short what is the one thing that we need to leave, uh, keep in mind well we should not be apologetic at all that we are in, riding in the wave of feminism because it is because of feminism that we are where we are today. We go back to the history of feminism uh, from the suffragist movement in the 1920s, the right to vote in the United States of America, the civil movement, the right to work for women and all the way to where we are. We have a historical journey of the scores and gains of feminism. And therefore we should not be ashamed of stamping our authority and saying, yes, we are, and we shall continue. All we need to do is try and accommodate men into the wave of our feminism, because we know we have men who believe in the spirit of feminism and have supported us to where we are. For me, probably I will not be where I am if I never had support of my husband and my brothers and, and some male colleagues who really believe in my potential. Amen. Sisterhood is indeed, Amen. Pot, uh, sisterhood is indeed a, a, a powerful. Amen. And we, we, with sisterhood, we actually can move mountain. We have Amen. seen it happening in the National Assembly. It can happen anywhere. If all of us decided to hold each other's hands, Thank mentor so each much. other, pull us, yeah. pull us pull ourselves up, not down, sisterhood is indeed very powerful. Amen. And I'm seeing memory, memory from Feminet is agreeing with you. She says yes to feminism, no, if not, but we were. So I, I feel so sad. It's been such a great discussion. Um, but we shall keep we shall keep in touch after this. Um, so I'm just gonna take this back to Sheila. Uh, but just to thank everyone, to thank our panelists. Uh, amazing guys to thank all the participants. I, I saw a lot of people that uh, within the network, Joy Chenyozi. I mean, so many, too many people to mention. So thank you all, and uh, we'll see you during the next discussion. So back to you, Sheila. Okay. Thank you very much, Kingwa, for the good moderation, and also I like the passion and enthusiasm that you have when, when it comes to women topics, or other women in leadership and women in governance topics. That's really, really nice. Thank you. Thank you also for the panelists who graced our, our session this evening uh, for the fruitful insights that you gave as far as uh, what you're doing in the different organizations that you will present. We have a legislator, we have a representative from the grassroots, we have a representative from the business sector, uh, and then we had also uh, um, 
uh, what's her name, uh, the lady from Mandeleo uh, Wanawake movement, which is a movement that uh, was very, um, I can say it played a very key role uh, back in the days as far as, you know, bringing a lot of women issues is concerned, uh, is concerned and empowering women, especially, who use that movement to actually get into, into, into the political space, but it's still it's still very vibrant and it's still very uh, visible with what with uh, the activities that they are doing. So I'd just like to maybe mention a few needs and wants that, uh, that I picked up from the conversation uh, for the last two hours. And some of these needs were very basic and things that we all know, for example, security, basic needs such as food, shelter and clothing, just that human dignity for women. That is both from the grassroots and also women who I can say are already well established as yourselves, who are leading well established organizations, issues to do with resources, uh, that is money, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all issues that whether you are a woman from a machinani or a woman who is already a legislator or a woman who is leading a well esteemed organization, we all face some of these issues. But now it's upon us, especially as women like you who are already in, 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 in um, can say you've made some milestones as far as your careers are concerned to help or rather um, pull the women who are, already, who are still at the grassroots level who are still maybe under privilege or underrepresented, you know, and bring out these issues, have these conversations, put them up as little projects that you can do in your esteemed organization for the legislator, for example, you know, push for some of these uh, issues to be taken up um, as, as, as bills, you know, and laws. My Moshimi was talking about the, the, the different bills and, and uh, laws that uh, some of them are up for amendment, for example, the SGBV bill, she also talked about the other bills, like the Family Bill, the Children Acts, uh, the Two-Thirds Gender Bill, that one has, has, has always been a very big issue. We have now an issue with the teenage pregnancy that is, 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 uh, has come uh, due to this, uh, for example, has really been uh, what uh, brought into the limelight, especially during, uh, during this uh, COVID period. And uh, this is something also that really needs a legislative uh, kind of uh, solution for it, at least to 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 be you know to be taken up seriously from the community levels. So um, some of the solutions that we came up with also as a parting shots collaboration that is very very key. That's why also partners like uh, us who are in the civil society space or rather in the non governmental organization space are here to listen to some of these um, what uh, solutions that you're suggesting. Then see how we can work together and try to move forward. So collaboration, economic empowerment, political goodwill is definitely important. The mindset, how do we change the mindset of, 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 of our women? You know, that starts from our women from Mashinani, our young women and older women who are experienced, for example, like you, how do we change, start shifting this mindset, you know, and, and, and empower more women too. And now that we have, mm -hmm. And now that we are actually at this point where we are, what is this? Uh, I think this has been a very, very good discussion. Wow, um, I don't know what just happened there. <laughs> Uh, okay. And I was just saying, um, yeah, how do we change this? This, you know, this mindset. Um, I also like one one solution that uh, Easter gave on having intergenerational uh, what conversations or rather movements or intersectional or intergenerational kind of. Uh, uh, convenings and movements that's very very key especially for women like you who are already experienced and working in collaboration with the younger women uh, who are still trying to grapple to get into this space you know just working together have these conversations coming up with good solutions from both ends and see the way forward as far as helping you know women to really get into into this space and have a voice, you know, is concerned that that was that was very, very good. And um, yeah, and also, and lastly, about sisterhood, you know, there's always been this um, <laughs> narrative that women are their own worst enemies. But to be very, very honest, I want to concur with what Honorable Omushamba was saying that we should uh, really work together, we should really, uh, you know, pu put that that silly mentality behind that oh you know yeah uh, that silly mentality of yeah like uh if you for example women who are more successful like you start feeling like you you like for example you're jealous or you you know you're not looking at it as this woman who is in that political space can be really helpful as far as sorting out some of the issues in the community are concerned but we're just looking at it from a very uh, retrogressive kind of uh, mindset which is not good so just bringing, working together and supporting each other, you know, to push for more and more uh, women issues 
from the grassroots way up, which can really uh, be taken up uh, by women who are already representing us in the in, in the in the in the bungas or rather in our parliament, and rather you know working on some of these gender responsive uh, policies and laws, and also putting some of our issues also in the budgets, and then boom, we have our issues sorted out. So that is what CAS is also pretty much doing. We really empower uh, women. We work with a lot of, um, one of our target group is rather the women coming up with good capacity building programs uh, to really emphasize or rather, um, yeah, emphasize or empower you on how to legislate and provide a representation role. And uh, also issues such as advocacy, networking, um, uh, lobbying, how to pretty much go about this, especially as women who are already in this space, so that you can really uh, support, you know, women more and represent as well, for example, in Bunges and also in the different leaderships, the leadership roles that um, some of you are already in. So I just like to say thank you very much for this um, conversation this evening. Thank you for your great and fruitful insights. And that's it from our end. I'd like to wish you a good night. And again, thank you very much. All right, everyone, have a good evening. Um, and we'll be in touch. Bye. Be in touch. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you once again. All right, have a good evening, Sheila. Good night. <laughs>